Well, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really excited to be talking about this topic. It's a topic that is really uh, dear to me. Um, so uh, let's get let's get started. Um, so there's been a lot going on around open source for a number of years, and we've seen lots of different activity in that space, and lots of really interesting um, articles and um, thinking happening uh, that are really discussing some of the ways that we're seeing um, the ecosystem and the community evolve. And I think one of the, the first really important um, uh, such piece of, of, of writing to me is Nadia Egbal's Roads and Bridges. It's been published now in 2017, so it's not a recent um, um, work anymore, but I think it's it's really foundational in, in, in re, sort of like rethinking um, the open source ecosystem. Um, and we've seen a lot of activity uh, and lots of people writing really controversial pieces um, about uh, open source in the last like five or six years. Uh, this is an example of a really interesting article by John Mark um, and uh, uh, just as interesting answer to that article uh, by Mike Overby, um, who really talks about um, how large corporations are benefiting from open source and not necessarily um, uh, giving back to it. Um, and we've also seen in the open source space, um, uh, uh, lots of people um, put, putting um, uh, companies building open source software up against cloud providers. And this is an example here, uh, you know, where the, the subtitle is actually cloud infrastructure providers threaten the viability of open source, right? And we've seen the reply from cloud providers uh, about uh, these topics and concerns of uh, large open source vendors becoming not so open source anymore. Um, there's uh, also been um, a lot of work around the ethical aspect and the ethical considerations of open source um, um, and sort of like the impact that open source has on the broad, broader ecosystem and on end users too. Um, and we've even, you know, we've even seen sort of like diehard um, open source uh, people like Bruce Prince, who's at your, uh, the origin of the open source um, or, organization, the, the, the OSI, um, and, um, uh, you know, start uh, talking about the, um, the, the issues with open source and the fact that it's really hard uh, for it to be funded. And uh, more recently, I'm sure you, you, you haven't missed uh, the, the sort of like really big security issues we've had uh, right before the, um, the new year uh, was logged for J and followed into the new year was callout.js and faker.js. Um, and, you know, I think it's fair to say that over the last course of the last like four or five years, we've really noticed uh, what we can essentially call like an open source crisis, right? Um, we've seen maintainer run out. We've, um, uh, we've seen people claiming that cloud is capturing too much value. Uh, we've, seen, we've seen ethical concerns over the impact on end users of open source. Um, and um, we also are experiencing now uh, a real uh, software supply chain security uh, uh, crisis to some degree in which open source has a very large part. Um, and so, uh, you know, that begs the question, well, what's going on? Like, why so, so much drama around uh, this space right now? And, um, you know, I posit that what we're actually experiencing right now, what we're witnessing is the emergence of new constituencies. Um, and, you know, when you consider um, open source, uh, the, the way we've been thinking about open source um, has been essentially with the four freedoms, that's more around free software, arguably, and um, the open source definition. And that as a tool worked really well in a much smaller ecosystem where there was a ton of overlap between the users of the software and the developers, right? Essentially, if you wanted to use software um, 20 years ago, you had to be pretty technically savvy to be able to do so. And so obviously you see this huge overlap between um, uh, people building software and people using it because you just couldn't use it without like really understanding how it was built. 
right? And um, of course, um, this has uh, dramatically changed as open source moved from being uh, this really niche um, aspect of uh, software itself, which was itself very niche, to you know powering, depending on who you ask and, and how it's measured, uh, like 50 to 90% of the lines of codes of uh, software, which pretty much runs everything nowadays from cars to phones to computers to pacemakers to uh, your fridge, right? And so obviously when you move from something that is very niche to something that is very mainstream, like, well, there's a lot more people and those people and those um, constituencies, those stakeholders um, are incredibly diverse and you no longer have this kind of overlap that we had uh, you know, two, two or three decades ago. And in, in this overlap in which having um, uh, tools as simple as the four freedoms or the open source definitions were enough to reason and understand this ecosystem. Um, so it turns out that there are other communities that have been uh, faced with this question of a broadened audience, a broadened uh, community, more constituencies a long time ago. Um, and uh, we can learn from them. And one of those that's particularly dear to my heart because I really come from the web is uh, W3C. And um, uh, the, so W3C is the standards organization that standardize, standardizes a lot of the um, technology for the web. And um, the reason that they're way ahead of us in thinking about this is that um, the, the browser has been um, widely deployed and impacting a lot more people way earlier than open source um, is technically uh, doing now. Although obviously the two are related. Um, and so the priority of constituencies is something that dates from uh, 2007 and actually an RIC uh, chat uh, between some of the folks that were in the HTML working group, some of which moved into uh, the WhatWeGi uh, uh, later on, um, that were trying to find um, solutions to um, make decisions when um, there were conflicting interests in a particular piece of technology. Um, and that was um, ended up essentially being um, um, put in written and become sort of part of um, uh, some of the, um, the um, uh, um, essentially the, the guidelines, the, the framework um, that is used to, uh, to this day to continue to make decisions about how specs for the web are uh, designed. Um, and this, um, uh, yeah, so the, the term changed a bit. It's now called put user needs first. It used to be priority of constituencies, but I think sort of the priority of constituencies captures uh, the how uh, more than the put user needs first, which captures sort of the, the why you want to do the, the rest of the whole thing. Uh, but regardless, it's the same concept, right? Um, and there's also some really interesting um, um, related thinking um, from the ITF uh, on this topic. Um, and, you know, the, the whole thing is best summed um, from the ITF's perspective as when there is a conflict between the interest of end users of the internet and other parties, ITF decisions should favor end users, right? And the priority of constituencies itself essentially focuses on um, uh, 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 servicing end users over authors, so those are uh, people actually building uh, web applications in W3C lingo, over implementers who are those building web browsers, over spec editors who are those actually writing the specs, over theoretical purity, which is uh, uh, you know the, the, um, making a decision that wouldn't be serving a user, but would be you know two APIs would be consistent with one another, for example, that would be th theoretical purity. Um, and so, you know, if you start looking at the size of each of these constituency, you also understand why this um, framework of thinking is not only um, 
uh, interesting, but also how it can actually help, right? End users of the web are billions. Uh, developers writing web applications are millions. Uh, engineers building browsers are in the thousands and spec editors are in the tens, right? So you can really see how um, essentially um, uh, uh, um, a spec editor putting in an hour extra work to make something more clear can save 100 hours at the implementer level, a million at the author's level, and a billion for end users, right? So there's this kind of like uh, impact that's interesting to assess. Right. Um, and, you know, as a side note, this is actually quite close to how the Apache Software Foundation um, thinks uh, about these things. Um, and if you look at the, um, uh, you know, the end user, authors, implementers, spec editor, theoretical purity, um, uh, and you remove kind of like everything that's in the middle, right? Um, and, and move like the, the implementers and the spec editors, think of them as community, right? And think sort of like authors and end users as uh, the recipient of what the community does. Uh, you really, you end up with like, you know, community um, is more important than theoretical purity, right? And this is kind of like community over code. And that's really close to, oh, sorry, I'm going too fast with the, that's really close to the sort of like Apache uh, mantra of, of really thinking about the people over thinking about code. Um, so can we actually take this uh, priority of constituencies that was designed for the web and use it for open source? And what would that look like if we actually did so? So let's first have a look at like who exactly are the main stakeholders that we can think about when we think of um, open source software, right? So, um, you know, at the heart, we have maintainers, right? Uh, we also have contributors to the project. Then we have app developers. So those are people that would be uh, using that software to uh, build applications, right? We have the cloud infrastructure, which is, um, um, uh, you know, uh, deploying that software, uh, that open source software, so it can be used by app developers. And then we have end users, people actually using that software. And at the very end, we have people, right? Because when you're thinking about software, I can, um, you know, I can be using a piece of software to do something about someone that isn't using that piece of software, but that is impacted by my usage of the software. Right? For example, um, imagine that you're walking down the street as a person, right? Um, and there is a camera uh, that is um, do, you know, um, filming you and using AI to identify you, right? You technically not using the software, but the software is being used on you and it impacts you because maybe you didn't want people to actually know you were walking down that street or you're in a surveillance state and that's something that's, uh, uh, you know, that you're really like obviously concerned about. Um, so, um, you know, it, it goes to this whole way. So if we actually um, ordered these, we end up essentially was, uh, you know, uh, people, over end users, over app developers, over cloud infrastructure, over contributors, over maintainers, over theoretical purity. So that's kind of what an open source priority of constituency would look like. Um, and so, you know, that kind of begs the question, well, is uh, the priority of constituencies a silver bullet? Like, is it um, the framework that we're missing to think about open source properly, uh, does it solve all of the web's problem? And obviously, I mean, yeah, that's the, the, the answer isn't the question. Uh, the answer is no, right? By itself, that's not enough. Um, and so let's look um, a, a bit as to what the problem uh, was the priority of constituency um, is um, in the web. So, one of the key issue that we see in the web, you know, when you, when you think about the fact that you want to move the work as upstream uh, towards the as much towards the spec editors as you as you possibly can, right? Uh, you quickly realize that this implies that folks that spec editors, right? have a lot more work to do than implementers and implementers have a lot more work to do than authors and authors have a lot more work to do than end users, right? 
So that's kind of fine if the economic situation of all of the players matches this. And if you look at this uh, slide here, you see that, you know, on average, um, um, end users are just people of, of the web, right? Um, and so they, uh, you know, tend to have like people money, i.e. not a lot compared to a corporation, right? If you move to authors, which again is W3C lingo uh, to talk about web developers, um, you will see in that space, uh, software vendors are actually much more well off than individual people. They're usually small corporations. Um, so, you know, you have this, this sense of authors have more money than end users. So that kind of makes sense because they actually have more work to do, right? And if you move to implementers, you're now talking about the browser makers. So essentially folks like Microsoft, Apple, uh, Google, uh, et cetera, right? Um, and you obviously see there that they have a lot more money. And again, that makes complete sense. Now, what happens when you move to spec editors? Well, it turns out that although a lot of spec editors are actually folks working for implementers, there's also a lot of what W3C calls invited experts um, that are um, uh, people that are uh, helping write specs because they really care and then they're usually doing that either on their own time or uh, as sort of like freelancing on like uh, consulting arrangements and often with very little money right and also there's a number of organizations in the world that could really benefit from being involved in the spec editing process because they get impacted by it that don't have the means to actually contribute right so what do you realize here well there is like this huge discrepancy in uh, means between implementers and spec editors, right? This is like a really big problem. And so essentially to try and avoid that, what really needs to happen is money has to flow upwards to help the spec editors actually take on a larger share of the work as they should, right? Um, in order to um, benefit the whole uh, chain and really move all of the, the work as upstream as possible. I mean, I've, I've talked about the, you know, this issue a while back. Um, there has been um, in increasingly help with um, uh, open source, uh, W3C uh, and uh, W3C members helping out invited experts um which are you know folks working on specs but not working uh for uh, uh, a large corporation um and uh that still needs more work right um and, and i'm sure of course like you'll you'll recognize how this kind of issue was people actually doing a lot of the work at the very top like very upstream are, are having financial difficulties right so if we move this back to open source and actually start thinking about money um, uh, we're going to, uh, you know, notice uh, a problem again. And so that kind of makes this priority of constituency, uh, not only kind of a direction as to where work has to move and who you have to um, um, think about first when there are conflict of interest, but it also serves as a canary in a coal mine, um, so, sort of like pointing out uh, when there are discrepancies in the economic situation of the different stakeholders and, and, and how that actually impacts the, um, the health of the overall ecosystem, which I think is kind of at the heart of the crisis that I was talking about in the beginning of this presentation and that we're witnessing in open source right now. Right. So again, looking at people, end users, app developers, cloud infrastructure, providers, contributors, maintainers, and theoretical purity, right? Uh, well, what do we notice? Uh, well, everything is going fine up until you start going to contributors and maintainers, right? You see this nice move from like people and users, app developers having more money, cloud infrastructure having more money. And then, well, contributors, it depends, right? It can be individuals. Um, it can be small corporations, um, you know, small companies. And same for maintainers, right? And so, again, we're noticing this unbalance here between folks that need to do more work that are uh, close to upstream, but that actually have very little means. And so again, sort of the suggestion to solve this problem is to figure out ways to move money uh, and means upwards. I mean, this could be money, it could be uh, like lots of different resources, right? Uh, but really sort of funding that upstream work, um, which is important essentially for the, the health and the balance of the overall ecosystem.
right? So uh, uh, I'm actually uh, on time, which is wonderful. Um, essentially, uh, what I really like with W3C's priority of constituencies is that it is uh, it was designed to do two things. The first thing is to keep focus on the impact that you have downstream from where you're working at, because that's what matters, right? Um, when you are writing a spec or when you are maintaining a project, uh, you have to keep in mind not only your own uh, benefit, but also how is this going to impact um, constituencies, stakeholders downstream? Um, is it going to make people's life um, hell? Is it going to make it really difficult to deploy? Is it going to make it difficult to build on top of? Like all of these different topics from ethical concerns to developer experience are all sort of like baked into this really simple um, tool, this really simple uh, conceptual framework of the priority of constituencies. In case of doubt, think about the, uh, the, the, the folks more, the most downstream, uh, the end users, the people at the, uh, at the sort of like the bottom of this whole structure um, and how they are impacted, right? So that's the first thing. The second really nice aspect of the, the priority of constituencies is that it really helps to maximize the benefits to the commons by upstreaming stuff. Right. I mean, we all know we all know this intuitively. Uh, upstreaming is really good. Right. It's good for the ecosystem. Um, it, it's good for the projects. It's good for the people relying on the project. Right. And so um, uh, this this uh, this framework that this priority of constituencies really shows that the more things are upstream, um, the the cheaper it is. Um, to um, to do the work, like the, the less hours it actually consumes of like everyone's time um, and the more effective that is, right? Um, and so then lastly, what if the priority of constituencies wasn't really designed to do, but if you lay it down like this, what it really shows is, um, you know, where there is actual uh, discrepancies between uh, the work expectations if you're really close to upstream and the economic situation um, of uh, depending on where you're positioned, right? Um, so it's a tool that is great to think about these issues and um, uh, really sort of like uh, put a spotlight on the areas where we're seeing lots of work expectations and few resources, right? And um, in the web, it's clearly on the spec editors and open source, very clearly maintainers and contributors should be the ones doing the most work if we want to think of maximizing the benefits to the, the commons. It's much better uh, if everyone upstream stuff. It's much better if a project is well maintained rather than having you know everyone downstream having to patch it, uh, right? But this requires um, adequate resources. And what we're seeing in open source is we don't have those resources, right? So uh, anyhow, I, I think the priority of constituency is a wonderful little tool to think about these issues. Um, and uh, that's all I have for you today. So uh, we have a few minutes for questions, discussions. I'd love um, to hear what your thoughts are. And uh, thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much uh, for this very insightful talk. Um, I Yeah, I really enjoyed the the picture really that this um, this paints basically um, how things are structured and how things should be should be structured um, here. Um, and I think from at least from from it seems like let's say money is moving slowly upstream now. Um, in the discussion, at least, is there. Um, let's see the log for J, log for Shell. Um, a lot of discussion was okay. How can we fund it better? There are a lot of initiatives. Do you see? Is there anything that that caught your eye? Where you see, okay, they they are implementing basically this this theory already. There, there are good efforts in in moving that upstream. Um, so I mean, clearly, like things are moving, right? And so the answer is um, yes. But then when you look at the scale of the problem and how much is actually moving. Uh, you know, I, I have more concerns, right? Um, which is that um, 
you know, the, the, the amount of, 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 if you're talking like literally money resources, well, for, I mean, first of all, we can't just talk about money resources, right? Because that's not the only thing. And in most cases, actually, that's not what's needed. Right. Um, so, you know, that's, um, um, uh, money is one aspect of the problem, but the way we're looking at this right now is it doesn't feel like, it feels like the movement is right, but it doesn't feel like the picture of what the situation is, is well understood and well shared. Like the discrepancy is absolutely staggering between how much money is, um, uh, used in open in uh, sorry in proprietary software, right? Like if you look at uh, I did some some back of the envelope math in a different talk a while back, and there's roughly a, a trillion dollars spent a year on developer salaries. A trillion dollar. Like if you actually stack a hundred dollar bills, right? It's enough to make a skyscraper. Like it's it's like you know it's it's beyond imagination how much one trillion dollars is, right? And when we're talking about like massively exciting efforts in uh, trying to uh, fix open source security, we're talking about like one, two, maybe $5 million, right? So, you know, it's like, it's a lot of, it's a, the order of magnitude is, is you know, a, a, a $5 million and $100 bills sits on a table, on a desk, right? Compare that to like the amount of money that's spent in property degree software. You're talking about vastly different numbers. And then consider that, you know, as I was sitting at the beginning of this talk, depending on how you count, sort of like 15 and 90% of actual lines of codes running for anything are open source, right? So you're talking about spending, you know, like 0.001% on open source, whereas, you know, it's like actually 90% of your code. That doesn't make any, that doesn't compute. So yes, the direction is good, but I mean, come on, like we're not <laughs> looking at this properly. Okay, um, there's another question um, from the audience. Um, how do umbrella organizations such as Software Freedom Conservancy, FSF, Apache, and so on fit into it? So that's a great question. Um, so I, I think in um, mainly in two ways. Um, one is organizing, well, three ways. One is organizing the effort of uh, different um, different stakeholders. Right, which is you know what they do already. The second one is providing a whole bunch of infrastructure, which they also do already. And I think there is an opportunity to start thinking about a third option. And I'm not sure existing umbrella orgs are actually properly designed and organized for that. Which is, I think we need to think about uh, paying maintainers, not developers building the software but um for lots of projects actually paying folks to do sort of like the the work that nobody really wants to do that's not super exciting but needs to happen you know the maintenance right uh, making sure that um uh, bugs are triaged and like security patches are applied and like the right version is released and all of that stuff right and and i think there is um uh, appetite in the broad community for people to actually do these kinds of jobs uh, part time or you know uh, on top of something else, um, and I think we should leverage this. Okay, yeah, um, I think a final question that we have um, is a, a comment from uh, from someone watching, um, saying, "I appreciate a lot all of your efforts thinking outside the box to find more balance into the open source scenes." Um, I remember another talk from you about licenses. How do those topics connect? How do those ideas connect? Um, that's a great question. Uh, they connect initially for me because I was thinking about these two things about at the same time. Um, I don't have a better answer for now. I, I think, no, l let me try to give a better answer. Um, I, I think that um, my thinking around licenses and my thinking around this uh, are both part of actually making us as a community more concerned about our downstream impact and how what we do is then used and uh, for the benefit of people or not, right? Mm -hmm. And making us more um, uh, aware of this and, and more intentional about this. So um, uh, yes same sort of like um, underlying concerns, 
uh, and wants and desires, right? Um, but looking at it from a different um, uh, perspectives, I think the priority of constituency is um, uh, more pragmatic, more practical, and can reach a lot more people than uh, works around licensing. 